So good, uh, good morning. This is, we continue uh, another activity of the Athena of the Hellenic Mediterranean University International Office, the Hellenic Mediterranean University um, uh, in general. Uh, this is the activity regarding um, how to teach better mathematics. We are not mathematicians. Can, at least I cannot see, no, Olga Timutseko from, uh, from Albok University. No, even though Olga is a, an engineer. Um, so I think, uh, that um, what we are trying to do through this series of talks to invite people um, very active in this topic beyond our uh, ecosystem in order to provide information how to teach mathematics better using different pedagogies, using different technologies. Uh, since, you know, mathematics is a key course for the digitalization of society, digitalization of the universities. You know, this is essential to have a feeling what is the impact of mathematics and how, how can we use mathematics in order to read things and make research? This is essential. So before I start, you know, and give the floor to our uh, distinguished speaker, very experienced uh, uh, academic in Erasmus in, and also in teaching mathematics through his Erasmus activities, let me give a short introduction about um, our speaker. Um, Professor Gregor Macridis holds a PhD in Applied Mathematics from Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, US. He taught mathematics in higher education since 1986. And following his activities, he's very active regarding students, you know, how to help students to learn mathematics, mathematical competition in mathematics, but you know, he's going to speak to us about more. He worked as a teacher trainer at the Cyprus Pedagog Pedagogical Institute from 1995 to 2000 as the Dean of enrollment management at the University of Nicosia from 2000 to 2006, and as a director of research and international relations at the University of Cyprus, 2006, 2017. And in parallel, he was the executive director of the European Office of Cyprus from 2007 to 2016. Since 2017, he is a visiting professor in several universities in Europe. He's currently a professor of STEM education, STEM education, I'm sorry about my accent, uh, at the Pedagog Pedagogical University of Krakow in Poland. He's the CEO of Prognosis since March 2017. He has more than 100 publications in referred journals, conference proceedings, and in public press. He coordinated, he coordinated coordinating more than 20 European funding projects since 2002, and has been a partner in a more than 60. Actually, you know, I have followed, you know, his workshops and, you know, I strongly suggest them if you are new or even if you are experienced in how to write proposals, this is a nice initiative. So um, let me continue. Uh, most recent projects he coordinated were st STEM for students, European networking of STEM school students for exchange and co-creation, facilitate artificial intelligence guidelines for facilitating the learning of artificial intelligence by school students of grade seven to 12. More than this, you can find, you know, because his CV is very long in our website. Uh, as I mentioned, he's also, in something this is very important for the universities and internationalization as well in general, he's also the initiator of the Erasmus Plus Mobility Barometer under the U European Association of uh, Erasmus Coordinators since 2014 with the cooperation of the European Commission. Uh, so I would like to give the floor um, to Professor Macridis to travel us through his experience to how to teach better mathematics or his suggestions. And the floor is yours, uh, Gregory. And thank you very much once again for your contribution to our ecosystem and our society. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues, for joining here today. I don't want to disappoint you that I will not uh, deliver a lecture on mathematics, but I will uh, deliver uh, a presentation on, on future learning, of course, includes mathematics. And maybe mathematics is the engine behind um, cooperative learning and project-based learning activities for the learning of the future. So what I'm going to present, of course, are uh, results and development of uh, different, several projects. And what is proposed, of course, through this is based on uh, uh, validation and uh, European-based uh, expert uh, focus groups uh, results. 
Uh, and of course, uh, okay, let me go into the in, into the sharing. Uh, so I will be sharing with the sound because I have some short videos to show you also. Okay, and do you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen, thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, the title of my presentation today is a paradigm shift to education 4.0. And I will explain, of course, uh, uh, what is this about, the STEM school of the future, and of course, building the puzzle, because um, uh, around the, the learning of the future, the school of the future, there are many different uh, uh, parameters we need to consider. But allow me to start with what Einstein said many years ago, who said, Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is becoming more static uh, or easily accessible or really uh, re recoverable. But of course, in order to produce new knowledge or, or, or develop innovations, you need imaginations. And the problem here is that we're trying to imagine the future with today's technologies. And we can never be sure what will be the technologies in 20 or 30 years. If we, if we go backwards to the 90s when we had uh, the first uh, internet technologies, etc., we will never imagine that someday we will be using our smartphone and open a video and talk to our wives, whatever, parents, and even be free because it's through internet, paid internet. So and today is part of our life in the 90s you wouldn't believe that this would be e so easily accessible. Huh? And if you see, go back and see newspapers of the 60s, uh, they tried to imagine things in, in the 60s, but we saw them uh, uh, some, we saw them happen after 40, 50 years. So we need to imagine, and I will use the word imagination in certain slides that you will see. So let me move. Um, in order to really uh, try to understand the needs, and where we're going for the future, we need to, to consider a little bit the past. These two photos are showing um, two classrooms with 100 years of difference. And the question, how much differences, how many differences we see? Of course, not much if you really, if you really consider them. Okay, in the right picture, you see some color. You cannot see the faces because of GDPR. You see some screens and some whiteboards. Other than that, the classroom or they say the delivery of knowledge or learning uh, is more or less in the same structure, huh? a classroom. The question is, can we afford to remain like this? And I'm not talking about only secondary education, I'm talking about higher education. And I will comment later on what some um, uh, progressive, I should say, uh, Americans are, are saying, or what will, will happen in 2050 if we continue to teach in this way? So let me go to the next slide. In the early 50s, uh, if we wanted to have a classroom with a cool air, the only solution was to have an open sky classroom. Okay, So I managed to find this nice photo to just make this comment. But of course, nowadays we can see classrooms with latest technologies and fully air conditioning, etc. I was lucky to visit uh, five years ago the Samsung High School in South Korea and make a presentation there. And I couldn't imagine what I saw. It was a school, a boarding school of 100 million that was cost in 2013. And of course, uh, I have seen many things there. We have time later on. I can what I have seen there. But um, in, in the 60s, if some of you remember, uh, you are my age, maybe some of you also, um, I remember these blackboards on wells where you could move them to the library and have, a, and have a, a class there. So this was the portability in a sense of the 60s. And, uh, and but nowadays, of course, portability is much different. In, in, in Korea, I have seen kids without uh, carrying a back, no books. So everything was in a tablet, for example, the notes, the books, everything in one tablet. Um, let's continue. Um, 
And another thing in that school, uh, just to comment, is that uh, there was internet but no Wi-Fi. So you can connect to internet, but you cannot have a Wi-Fi while you are in school and, and, and play with it, for example. Um, let me discuss a little bit what we mean by education 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. You probably know this already, but 1.0, I will say, is what we had up to the introduction of internet and the first laptops, I will say, and, and then first projection systems, whatever. So up to that time, uh, actually technology was confiscated uh, if, you, if you brought it in the classroom. So it was, everyone, everyone has lived through this process. Uh, no, no, uh, you, you could be in a class lesson and, and the student will never speak sometimes. So uh, anyway, the, then we go to Education 2.0 when we had the first softwares, projections, internet, etc. And most education systems are still in this uh, level, I would say, uh, with some elements of Education 3.0 in some cases, sometimes in private education, but here, we started making some communication, of course, some cooperative learning, and etc. But everything is on exam-based approach. What do we mean by that? We give information to the students, and we consider that this information will become knowledge through an exam system. And this is the mistake. And this is the mistake we have been doing for many years because students many times memorize. Yeah, even mathematical procedures they memorize, they apply them, they do well in tests. After some months, they forget about it. And then they have what? They have nothing, no competences. So information becomes knowledge when you apply it in a process of, of creativity work, like a project, for example. And we have the situation sometimes that um, uh, teachers teach something in October, and then in March they need to apply it, so students have to remember it. And the students say to the teacher, "Teacher, I, I don't, we don't remember what, what is what you taught us in October. So what do you do? You teach again? There is no time to teach again. So we need solutions for that, and we have solutions for that, which I mentioned later. Education 2.0 is more or less what we are doing today in most education system, but what we realize with the pandemic is that we were not ready for the pandemic in most cases. So digital learning has shown to become very important, but what is really digital learning? Hmm? Uh, what do we mean by digital learning? Also, there is no time to keep teaching, keep training, sorry, the teachers. The teachers have to become adaptable to change. So the teachers in order to become adaptable to change, they have to develop competences themselves. And this is another challenge. Um, so education 3.0 is what we like to say that we are doing more student center, because we do say today that we have uh, student center approaches, but we're, we're talking about teaching hours. We should be talking about learning hours. We talk about teacher, but the teacher should not be called a teacher anymore, should be a facilitator of learning. And we see this language used also in Erasmus Plus, or even later on as a co-creator. So uh, the, 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 the Americans, uh, we happen to, to cooperate with the largest archi architectural, architectural office in the United States that is building only schools, is designing only schools, they design schools in, 52 countries for 12 billion so far. They have offices in US, in Florida, in Canada, in India, in, and in Israel. And of course, they, they, they cooperate also with, with Harvard universities. And, and these are the people who say that if we continue to teach in this way, by 2050, more schools will close. And what they mean by that is that uh, even in Europe, very soon, we will have a, a regulation or a directive saying that all EU citizens will have the right to do homeschooling. If this happens, then the, the students will come and say to the teacher, come on teacher, I'm not going to come in class. What, what you writing on the board for six hours, copying whatever you write on the board without having the time to think and understand what you're writing. And then I need another six hours home to understand what I copy from the board or I have to go to private tutoring, 
and I waste all this time because you want to continue to teach using the board. And instead I can, uh, if I had the, your, your teaching in videos or called video learnings, actually in three different speeds, we have a project developing this. I could be anywhere, any place, anytime, watch the video for two hours and learn what you want to teach me in six plus six, 12 hours to understand it. So this, this change, this paradigm change, when you, if you want to say it, uh, it will happen whether we like it or not, because the students will impose it to us. Uh, uh, and so imagine, uh, we use the word imagination, or what Einstein said. Imagine all students have the right to do homeschooling. There is digital learning videos everywhere for them to learn. Uh, you may say, of course, you have to test them, but uh, testing may disappear after some years. Huh? We have artificial intelligence coming in our lives and we may see things changing for uh, assessing the knowledge and the competence of people. But anyways, imagine again, that 80% of the students choose, choose to do homeschool. What will happen? About 80% of the schools will close. The teachers will not lose their job, but, but uh, because these are the people who are going to develop the digital learning, but but of course, this will not happen because schools will change eventually. We have seen schools in the United States without classrooms. We have seen piloting schools in Netherlands where after a success story, they, they, they demolish walls in, in public schools now to make more open spaces. We have seen the, the American architect uh, uh, remodeling schools and pressing one button and the wall go, goes down to the earth and then one button of the world comes up, so creating open and closed spaces as, as needed. So things are changing towards uh, project-based learning, and because this project-based learning through bibliography and research shows that it gives a better competence and skills to students than the traditional way of teaching uh, nowadays. So let me, let me, uh, this one moment. Let me go to the next slide, which is the 4.0, that I think no education system is there yet. But here we see a lot of hybrid activities. We see more time for individual learning because there is this digital learning will allow more time to the teachers to spend with students. We see more project-based learning or only project-based learning. We see no classrooms maybe, or maybe we see amphitheaters where not for teaching, but for students to present to other students. So this is like um, uh, developing also the so-called communication skills. We see industry coming into the play to, uh, to make uh, presentations, to work with talented students to, to, we have another design through a project and model where talented students in mathematics who, who leave school because for the same reason that weak students are leaving school sometimes. They need challenge and uh, you can challenge them with projects through industry, including the universities in the middle to uh, uh, analyze uh, the communication, et cetera, et cetera. We have models like this. And of course, um, we have more virtual reality in the play. We have more artificial intelligence coming in, et cetera. But of course, competence and skills is comes into the play, play, which means competence-based learning. And people have to become, including teachers especially, adaptable to change. So let's see more. Uh, so we have the lesson plans nowadays, uh, but uh, we have seen learning plans. And we stop talking about lesson plans because lessons is based on teacher-based teacher, teacher uh, learning. But here we, we want student-based learning, student-centered learning. And we, we call the lesson plans now learning and creativity plans. So this is a new language we have used and we'll be using from now on. And of course, this in, in another uh, nomenclature, we have pedagogy, we, everyone knows what pedagogy is and andragogy. Andragogy is the uh, other learning in a sense. Cyberagogy is when the internet came in and of course everything is based on software, et cetera. But here, we should not be talking about any specific software because software are changing all the time. And then we go into uh, Education 4.0 where we 
we, we concentrate on Piaragogi, which means cooperation, project-based uh, uh, learning and cooperation between students, learning from each other, peer, peer uh, learning, etc. And Aftagoi, what is Aftagoi, which is a Greek word, is uh, self-learning. Huh? Self-learning is becoming very important, and this is supported by digital learning, of course. So this is the project, uh, first project that we base the uh, remaining and other projects that I will mention, where we, we discover, we analyze the needs, we started to see how we're going to design the school of the future. We discover what do the teachers need in order to become STEM teachers. There is no degree in STEM teachers, so there is no program coming from the universities. Uh, in, in my country, when they made the first STEM, STEM committee at the ministry, and, uh, and they invited the mathematicians, uh, biologists, physicists to, to sit together. The first mistake they made, they asked everyone to, to go home and come back each, each separately field to bring suggestions. And I told them, you started in the wrong way. The mathematicians should not work alone or the physicists or the biologists. They have to work together. Otherwise, there is no STEAM education. So. So this, this is the idea. We have to help the teachers be able to work together. But there is a problem. Mathematician says, I don't know biology. The biologist says, I don't know mathematics. How can I make a project with mathematics and biology? So they need help on how to work together to define or to create projects, activities for their students. So there is an interdisciplinary learning approach in a sense. OK. So we developed many things, but let me go through the website for a few seconds uh, to show you what you can find there. Um, we created um, the so-called uh, STEMI Observatory. In the STEMI Observatory, one can find many, many different things, but the main is they can find ready-made learning and creativity plans at two, for two different age groups, grade 7, 9, and grade 10, 12. And these are already, uh, in, in some of them are also translated uh, workshops, um, the learning plan, which is a template we created. And of course, you can find it in different languages nowadays. And of course, presentations and even videos, etc. So these are ready made design projects that you can assign to, to, to students. And these learning plans, of course, uh, assume a cooperation of minimum two teachers or two different disciplines. Okay. So if we have time, we come back later on and see this. But what else you can find in this platform? You can find uh, policy recommendations. You can find a training course that we develop. What are the elements of a training that the teacher needs in, in, in order to become a STEM teacher? How to construct learning and creativity plans? How teachers can work together? We have a, a case that's prototype. prototype on how all on how to work together and support uh, a, a project based learning with a group of students all these are published in the guidelines uh, in different languages how to help teachers and students work online we have another project the course so called steam hybrid how do you do project activity online at distance when some students are at home and some students are in in classroom how to support students in making oral presentations, huh? Disseminate, uh, communication skills, how to write papers, reports. Because we have a journal for students only now published. So we want to help the students be creative, write uh, research type reports, if, if possible, etc. cetera. And um, how to work on projects, et cetera. So let me move back to to the slides and move faster. So these are some of the guidelines. You can find them on the website and download them. This is the 18 steps um, prototype for working two teachers working together to support students. This is uh, what the learning and creativity plan looks like. We also you can also find uh, evaluation rubric on uh, uh, suggested the evaluation rubric on how to assess students working in, in projects. These are the modules. And of course, in Education 4.0, we want competencies development through inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, competence-based learning, learning internships in the play, blended learning, 
And of course, micro credentials are coming into the play uh, for the competence as, as a competence and skill factor in the sense that the future teachers will not study a degree to become STEM teachers, but we need to create micro credentials for them. So one of the new proposals we're preparing now is to develop micro credentials for future STEM teachers. We also apply for one of these teacher academy proposals in September, and we hope to have a STEM teacher academy platform uh, if the project is approved. Learning methods is digital learning via Bring Your Own Device. I will mention the Bring Your Own Device in a moment. Information communication technologies, VR, AI, whatever we know today, huh? because in 20 years, maybe we have more technologies and different technologies. And of course, it's important to change infrastructures. And as I mentioned earlier, the Americans are not calling the future schools at school, they're calling them learning spaces, learning communities. Uh, so let me sh show you what we imagine as a design of a future school. We, we use nature, we use the bees world with uh, regular hexagons. Um, our, um, the CEO of this American architecture, uh, he told me a story. I happened to, to meet him in one, uh, the Education 2.0 conference, and he's an Indian American, of course, Nahid, Professor Nahid. He, he told me that uh, the Saudi Arabia asked him to design a school that has no second in the world, uh, not to worry about the cost of the school, but uh, they asked him also to make it look crazy. Anyway, uh, Professor Nai showed to me the, the, the school and he presented it at the Euromat conference in June in Thessaloniki. And uh, he used, of course, geometric uh, designs for the buildings, triangles, uh, whatever, squares, etc. But um, he, he used nature, but of course the issue there is that he told me that the, the school will be built, it will look like a landmark, but the problem people don't know what to do inside. So that's the problem of education is that we need to know what to do inside. This school uh, has a, also an athletic center uh, in one of the he uh, hexagons, which will be open in the morning and and close in the afternoon to open to the community. So the community will be supporting. This is uh, fully energy self-supported with uh, photovoltaics, you can see. Anyway, let me, let's go to see different perspectives. We designed the ceilings to be six meters, but nowadays the ceilings of the new schools will be eight meters high. So you can have drones flying inside the buildings. Uh, so let me show you more pictures. Uh, these are the laboratories based on today's knowledge of what we think we should have in the basement. Of course, one of the new projects now we designed was that is to do online laboratory work, and there is already software uh, free to use for that. But the problem is that teachers don't know how to use it. So this is another challenge uh, for the future. Of course, virtual reality environments is also another problem. You want to do with to, do, uh, to take your class of students in inside the pyramid, for example, in, uh, in Egypt, but this environment is not provided in your uh, virtual reality database. So you have to have virtual reality databases that can be editable easily by the teacher. So when you want to take your classroom to a new experience through virtual reality to be able to do this. And then we have, of course, satellite laboratories on different floors where students can access different uh, material or equipment they may need. The very quiet floor, the third floor, where is the creativity floor? And of course, all the other uh, uh, needs of a school. So these are cross sections, let me pass them through. Uh, this is the basement in, a, in an uh, animation, in a sense. Ah, about the sports, this is an interesting video. You, I, I show you this video in only a few seconds but you will see how the, the sports fields of the future will be in schools.
So what you see here is um, using the LED lights to change the same field into basketball, volleyball, etc. So this uh, saves, of course, cost, but you only pay once. So laboratory in the basements, uh, virtual reality rooms, etc. Uh, what is this? This is what we call learning stations. Imagine students working in a project and suddenly they realize that they need to apply the Pythagoras theorem. Uh, either they or they they knew it, but they they learn it, but they don't remember it, or they, nobody has taught them yet, but they need to apply it. So what 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 happens? Uh, they can they should, they cannot go back to a classroom to be taught. There's no time. They go work on the project. So what they can do with the direction of the teachers is to ask the students to go to learning stations, watch a video, and these videos will be. Um, available in, in three speeds, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So you can they can go and learn what they need to learn and come back to apply into the project. Or they can go together to a learning room, as we call it, where all together can watch these learning videos. The teachers may come in to discuss, they can discuss together and understand what they need to understand, uh, receive knowledge or recover knowledge, as we can say, and go back to, to their project work. So knowledge easily accessible but what is important is to apply the knowledge so if I, I go back take the information go to apply it to become knowledge this is the issue huh? so here's some more pictures ah we also imagine right imagination is more important we said as Einstein said we imagine some movement into the building so we design a train a magnetic train moving in a slow speed so students can jump on this train and work while they work. They can also go into backgrounds with, uh, so they are fully noiseless and work together. These are the learning rooms from outside, more learning stations. Ah, the other thing, why should we, the students see the same color of the school every day? We, we, we can change the colors of the school every day and actually make an app and give the students a choice to decide what color they want to see the next day. And, they, and this is possible to do it. Of course, it costs money now. If you are rich, you can do this. But in the future, it could become standard. Imagine, imagination. What we couldn't imagine in the 90s and we have them today, in 30 years from now, it would be a standard thing. So students can see different color every day in the school. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know how we do with time, but I think we are OK. Uh, we are OK. Uh, I mean, we, you have one more quarter. I mean, okay. if you would like to. Oh, for, oh, one more quarter for presenting? Yes, right. Okay, this is important. This is the international sign, sign language. What is this about? Um, we all know that uh, the sign language of every country, of every nation, is different. Even between Cyprus and Greece, there are differences, actually. Between Scotland and England, there are differences. So the mobility of uh, deaf people is minimal. Uh, but there is an international sign language that nobody really learns, learns this language. And we propose that in every future curriculum, there should be, everyone should learn international sign language, including those who are not deaf. And this is, this is important. We know real stories that um, some years ago, a kid whose parent was deaf and she knew the sign language was kidnapped in a car. And she was making the sign language to passing by cars to indicate that she was in danger. And it happened that someone knew sign language. He, he understood that the kid was in danger. He called the police and the kid was safe. Also, imagine someone behind the wall, behind the glass in a far distance is in danger and you cannot hear them. They can give you a sign. So if we all know the international sign language from early age, it's like we know all the languages of the world because we can communicate between us. And we are in, in a project uh, in sign, we're developing animator for people to learn. I mean, Nuno, of course, knows, is the coordinator of this. Is Nuno here or not yet? Anyway, uh, and of course, there is another project that the, uh, the, the uh, developing the, the international sign language for technology language, not technological, which doesn't exist. So we propose that in future curricula, 
international sign language is learned by every student from the primary education. This is a animation of the building I showed you earlier. Okay, so today for existing schools, what is happening, as I said earlier, in many countries, um, the, uh, this, the, the learning is secure in videos, as I mentioned, is what you can do. Train the teachers to become adaptable to change, train them to understand project-based learning and how to create projects and work between teachers of different disciplines and create open spaces in current learning infrastructure. And then you're ready. In the project where we have for STEAM Teacher Academy, the plan is to create a critical mass of future STEM teachers. When you have the critical mass, which should be minimum, I would say 50% of all teachers to know what is STEAM education, those coming out from the universities and those already in schools to develop this competence, maybe through micro credentials and be ready for this change. So eventually we will see things changing in cycles. We already have two public schools changing into STEM schools, but at the moment we do not touch the morning curriculum. We add uh, the afternoon for STEAM activities. So slowly we will see things changing. Uh, let me go now to tell you what else is happening now, create, creating. I mentioned already STEM Go Skype, where we design a platform how students can work in, pro in projects uh, from remote places. This also supports the flip classroom activity if you want to, or even cooperation between students of two different schools or two different countries. But this supports cooperation when the students are not all in the same place. And of course, not even the teachers. And we also develop a two-stage certification uh, for STEMI hybrid school labor. So one is to investigate, self-study, and then make a plan to improve and come back after the improvement to get the stage two. The Bring Your Own Device Learning is a project that is now piloting these uh, uh, learning videos in three different speeds. So we are transferring or making available all the teaching in classroom into videos. The TTF is a project bringing in the climate issues, environmental issues into the STEM learning. The excellence in math education is bringing debate, communication, and diversity in the learning process. The Facilitate AI is developing how to teach artificial intelligence in secondary schools. So we brought the academics to train the teachers what is artificial intelligence. And now the teachers are designed how to teach it to kids. The other proposal we're developing now, and it's part of the needs of the whole world, not only Europe, is how to teach or uh, facilitate the learning. I should not use the word teach, facilitate the learning uh, of students for uh, microelectronics, because this is the future. There's a big, large, big need of, uh, of competences and skill in microelectronics. We know that there are no many degrees in microelectronics. Microelectronics, one or two modules, courses in electrical engineering, electronic engineering degrees. Revealing is in higher education, but is designing the uh, kind of custom-made uh, virtual reality environments that the teacher needs in in the in the in the uh, learning process. The other two projects entering in all life is developing competence-based uh, uh, learning for teachers, and of course uh, qualification frameworks and adaptability to change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we support teachers in other words to become more ready for this. the STEM students design is running out to give voice to the students. We believe the students will bring the change. We remember the example with the homeschooling. So um, this project will develop, uh, is doing two things, has developed a platform in adapted 
to the gaming that the students are using every day. So we adapt to the students. We do not expect the students to adapt to us. If you're going into school systems and you accept the students to adapt to you, you lose them. Uh, we are in, in big discussion uh, uh, lately with people who talk about um, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, socio approach and socio um, uh, uh, sociological and psychological effects of digital uh, technologies to, to young kids. We, we don't agree with them anymore because uh, the, these effects are, are effects that we know in the last 30, 40 years. The, the future is different. Uh, if you ask the student what is uh, uh, what is communication or what is uh, socializing for you today, they will say, I don't want to socialize only with my classmates or my relatives or my neighbors. Socializing for me is this machine. I can communicate with 1,000 friends everywhere in the world anytime any, uh, 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 I want. So this is uh, socializing for young kids today. And we, we need to adapt to this. Otherwise, we will lose them. Anyway, uh, the activities of this is to really, we use this Discord project platform where students can post problems to each other. And the most active students are students of mathematics. You can, uh, you can enter this platform as well, but you cannot be interactive. You only students can, can get the student interactive access. And of course, uh, we will be selecting the most active students in by the January, the end of January, we will invite them in March at the Euromath conference, where we will have the kickoff of this European STEM school students network. So we will have the students like we have the Erasmus student network. We will have a school student network in Europe, which doesn't exist. And we call them STEM school, school student network. We will have them, we will be the, the, the advisors, the, uh, uh, the mentors and we will have them make their first uh, statement, let's say, at the European level. So this is the project all about, and we hope to have a STEM students 2.0 as a continuation. So let me just show you, yeah, this is what we can do on this platform. And of course, uh, you can enter this platform uh, and if you have students, invite them to join and become active. I stole this photo from Facebook some long time ago. I don't know, maybe you saw it, but this is telling us, it's giving us a message. These third world kids, they don't have technology today, but look at them, they, they smile to a shoe. Huh? It's, it's like they're taking a selfie. So imagine what these kids will do as soon as they get that smartphone in their hands. You know what they're going to do. So. The STEM Teacher Facilities Academy I mentioned, I hope it is approved, we will know in January, but this project will develop um, the um, critical mass of STEM teachers of the future. There will be many training activities taken on long summer uh, school activities for STEM teachers, et cetera, et cetera. And a, and a, a lot of uh, resources in the platform for, uh, for uh, um, I think Athena, as an Athena is mentioned as one of the 16 projects that could contribute to this as well. Okay, so we invest in the development of competences and skills, the competence to discover, record, and apply knowledge, and the competence to self adapt to change in technologies. Euromath and Euroscience is the only conference in the world, as far as I know, which uh, is for designed for school students. Teachers are participating also, but they can only offer workshops to students. We've been running this, this since 2009. The next one will be in Krakow, Poland. And in parallel to this, we run the European STEM conference, the third European STEM conference at the same place. So a lot of things are happening. There are many competitions, the math factor. The math factor is like the X factor, but you communicate mathematics instead of singing. Uh, or the math theater, there will be math theater Europe competition and many competitions, 10 different competitions and for kids and one for others, the STEM communication, like TEDx for teachers especially. 
Uh, so here it is, and that's it, I think. Uh, I can stop now. 45 minutes, I think. Almost, almost. Depends on almost. your words. But, you know, it was excellent. Thank you very so, much. Uh, be happy to, to, to discuss it. Gregory, please stop, stop sharing your screen of in course. order to give the floor to the audience. I have some questions, but, you know, first, the audience first. So if you have any questions, please, you know, raise your virtual hand in order to provide you the floor. Uh, uh, if So let me start until, you know, the audience will uh, warm up. I have, you know, several questions to you, Gregory. Thank you very much. It was like, you know, a real nice traveling, you know, how the education will look, uh, will, uh, look like, you know, other things, you know, are mentioned, some others not, but, you know, the majority of them has been mentioned. So I'm starting from the question. You were really nice, you depict and you describe how we should teach and how the teaching should happen in, you know, now or, you know, in some cases in the near future that we are going to be facilitators and the students, they can advise online material and then they can come to us just, you know, to discuss. Uh, any problems that they have, and we are going to be facilitators in order to advance the way of their thinking and how to apply, you know, what, uh, their knowledge. Probably, uh, the first. So the first, you know, really, you know, really, uh, a really big change that I can see is like the ECTS. You know how the ECTS now for exam now of course it has an ECTS workload of six, using you know the future that you know is with us now. I mean they have the material and don't they don't have to come to the class. How much big change it will be this about the allocation of the ECTS? Because the time that they spend in the classroom will be removed. And this is, okay. yeah. yeah, I will, I will, you know, this is my first question. I have a lot of them, but. Okay, when you mention ECTS, you mean then uh, you're talking about higher education, not school education. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, but the, because. Uh, in, oh, in higher uh, education, if you go sorry. into the, pro if you go into the project-based learning for most courses, of course, we see it is now blended and we see internships coming in. We see degrees, so four year degrees, three years in, in classroom and one year in industry, whatever. So we, we see that, that many universities already feel the need for internships, but uh, in whatever is assessed, regardless of the way it is assessed, whether it's assessed as a project uh, delivery, deliverable, et cetera, outcome, or is assessed through a test, whenever you assess, you provide ECTS. Mm -hmm. A successful Correct. assessment means ECTS. So I don't see a problem if we want to keep ECTS. But let me tell you that some people, some people are saying that in 30, 40 years, we're not going to have bachelor's or master's or doctorate degrees. They were going to have only micro credentials because Correct. they say, okay, I want, 20 micro credentials. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a company. I want you to tell me how to, to do, uh, to construct a, a table. And that's all I need. Give me a micro credential telling me that you know how to do this. Or give me a micro credential to know, tell me that you can handle uh, Excel, for example, program or whatever, or, or handle Moodle, for example. Micro credentials. So in the future, the company, the industries will be requiring more micro credentials. We already see Google uh, that they don't hire people with degrees. We saw United States removing the requirement of a degree for public service jobs, so so people can concentrate on competence uh, uh, based assessment instead of uh, knowledge based assessment. We see companies when they interview people, they consider knowledge to be number three. Knowledge are our degrees. Number two in their preference is competences and skills. And what is number one? Number one is communication. And, and the best example I always give is my smartphone. If I know what this machine can do, it's knowledge. If I know how to use it, it's a skill or competence. But nobody is going to hire me to sell this machine unless I can communicate what this machine can do and how it works. So communication or science communication, including that's why we have this math factor competition because it supports the, the math communication skill. Uh, this is what is happening. Is it yes? It's not a problem. If you want to keep it yes, as long as you have an assessment process, whether it's a test, whether it's a project-based assessment, competence-based assessment, etc., you give your ECTS. 
-hmm. I don't see it. Right. Yeah, so I would like to comment on this. We should not wait for 30 or 40 years. Eh? Already the microcredential is here. Already LinkedIn Learning is doing what you said. And LinkedIn is like a, an interface between, you know, marketing and acad academia. So the, as you said, Google, you know, Google and EDX, they are now they are converting from free open access platforms, you know, to even degrees uh, offer action. So I don't think so that we should wait for 30 or 40 years. This will happen, you know, next year or in two years or in five years, you know, for sure. And I would like also to ask you something. You, 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 ah, there are, uh, you presented very nice how, you know, the universities or the schools, I mean, but, you know, universities, they should follow. You cannot have different technology schools and then you go back to the, to the caves when you are going to the, the higher education. You know, the higher education should follow, you know, all these kind of, you know, facilities and uh, the learning spaces as you have presented. But now is the question like how universities, for example, like Oxford or Cambridge, or even, you know, Hellenic Mediterranean University can convert their spaces uh, with what, you know, with what funding they are going to do this. Who is going to provide the funding for public you know, universities or even, you know, private universities to exist? What are you going to say to the Cambridge that you are going over there and you can see all these nice, you know, buildings that they have, you know, all these rumors or these myths or this knowledge is on the walls. How are you going to, to say to them to how, how the conversion will be made? Well, the, 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 the issue here is not the buildings, you know. I mean, the, the, the issue is the methodology. You can use big buildings and convert them into, uh, into uh, project-based learning activities if you want to change the methodology of learning. So uh, the other thing is that many people say that the countries who, who are going to move first into project-based learning, they will become richer. <laughs> because they will be producing people, creative people, uh, people with uh, competences, et cetera, who will uh, eventually make their countries uh, more productive and richer. The problem is money, of course. That's why we have seen Saudi Arabia having a very the best, most modern school. The school I saw in, in, uh, in uh, South Korea in Samsung school cost $100 million, uh, sponsored by Samsung. So uh, if you have the money, you can do it. If you don't have the money, you have to do it progressively uh, in a sense, or, you know, uh, so that's why you said in three, four years, we can change. And I said 30 years, <laughs> because in 30 years, we will see new buildings coming in, probably designed like this. I, uh, my, my, my son happens to be doing his RIBA two master program equivalent to, to Arkiden and his work. They invite them to design uh, new schools in, in a region and he's de designing a school with no classrooms for them uh, based on this uh, philosophy. So he's, he's receiving the degree on, uh, on uh, STEM schools of the future in a sense. So um, things are changing. I, I had a presentation yesterday in a school in, in Limassol where they just started in the summer as a new school for Ukrainians and uh, Russians who live in Cyprus, et cetera. And they, they have temporary buildings and they're going to build new buildings. When I show them this design, you know what was the, the founder asked me? Please give me the phone number of the architect, you know. So uh, people who would be built in new developments, they will follow different designs, but you can have uh, designs that are uh, in the American, the, uh, Professor Nair from, from the American company, he's, uh, he's mod uh, changing the, the, the designs of existing schools by remodeling the walls. So by pressing one button, the wall comes down to the earth. Press one button, the wall comes up. If you have the money, you can do, you can do things. So that's why I don't say in three years, but I say in 30 because in 30, we will see these maybe new buildings, new designs coming into, into the uh, regular school systems, probably. Mm -hmm. My reply about the three years was just, you know, that, you know, we're not going to need bachelors because, you know, as you said, they we're going to be uh, judged about, uh, um, uh, how can they, we're going to be evaluated because of our competencies. So I, I like, I'm going to wait for 30 years, probably I will have more money to build, you know, this kind of building. Uh, and the last question before I will give the floor to our colleague from Alborg University, Professor Tim Senko, is the following. 
Uh, very nice, you know, also I have followed Nuno's suggestion in the Athena European University about the impact of the sign language, all right? And, you know, I totally recognize that this, if we know all of us, not only students, uh, us as well, you know, the sign language, we can communicate with everyone. But the thing is like during, regarding the presentation skills, one of the aspect of some, when you would like to convince someone to give me the money to build these, these new buildings, you know, the way that I spoke, the, my rhythm, the tone, the volume, you know, plays an important role in order to convince someone. How can I do this in the sign language? Uh, you cannot do it easily because the person who sign language doesn't have all the verbs we use. So that mm. it's not the full language. Uh, and I don't know, uh, the, the international sign language is improving. And as I said in another project, the TechWiz, that Nuno is involved also, um, we are building the sign languages for technology that doesn't exist. So, mm -hmm. um, so it, it, maybe we built uh, sign language with uh, more verbs or whatever. I don't know, so you, they can be convincing, but but uh, if the person who is going to decide on the investment is also, a, a, let's say it's a deaf person, then you, mm -hmm. have, then you have no choice other than using the, 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 and, uh, the sign language. Mm -hmm. And I have a comment, like the technology in electronics started, you know, indeed from 1947, you know, with the invention of the transistor, which was a very big breakthrough. And then we moved to microelectronics, but now the technology is nanoelectronics. So the same principles that you apply for microelectronics, can you share it with me in order to apply something in nanoelectronics? Or, you know, I can apply it, but I can see, you know, that I think Costas, that- I'm not, an, I, Costas, I'm not an expert in the field. So, oh, okay, all right, so okay. I'm a mathematician, but I, 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 I try to understand things also in artificial intelligence, et cetera. So, Excellent. so Excellent. since you went to back to 45, let me remind you that I happened to meet the person. 47, uh, 47. For, uh, yeah, uh, who discovered uh, the um, recording tape. You know how this was discovered? Because he was in a classmate, he was a classmate, a, a roommate of another uh, friend of his who was trying to sing opera, who was, uh, sounded lousy and, and he, he couldn't be, he wouldn't believe him. So he invented the recording tape in order to, in order to uh, uh, to play it back to him and to to show him that he he doesn't sing opera very well. Of course, he didn't make it. Uh, he didn't get the patent for that, so he didn't become rich. But if you if you take your credit card and look at it from behind, you see the tape is still used in the credit cards for recording information. Some other people became rich from that. But anyway, um, yeah, re you reminded me because you said 40 something that would, this was another <laughs> invention that never became innovation in a sense from the same person because he, other people invested in that anyway. Excellent. Thank you very much. I will give the floor now to Olga Timchenko uh, from Alborg University. Olga, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Gregory, very much for a nice and inspiring presentation. I mean, sorry that my camera refused to work. I don't know what Murphy is playing with my camera now. Well, uh, I have one remark and one question. First of all, that about rich countries and problem-based learning, maybe it's right, maybe not, I don't know. I'm now definitely working in a rich country and I'm working in university that practices problem-based learning for more than 50 years now. I think that costs of our education are absolutely comparable with costs of other non-problem-based universities in Denmark. So for me, it's more a matter of mindset than money. And what I really love is what we we're trying to do in this uh, recent, uh, recently finished um, um, project, Costas, what was its name, uh, with Rodrigo, when they said micro problem based learning. It's just mindset, try with small, give students small problems to solve. I mean, I deeply believe that problem based learning is answer to many educational questions of this world. And let me tell you again my favorite quote. In Denmark, which I repeat, it's a rich country, Olborg University graduates, and Olborg is not Cambridge, is not elite university by any means. Majority of our students are first generation at uni from family at university. 
10 years after graduation, our graduates have the highest average salaries in Denmark. So problem-based learning does something good to average people. It's not for elite. It's not that kind of education that absolute Ivy League or Oxford or Cambridge are educating, but that what society basically needs at large, that is what we provide. We do that for more than 50 years and we'll continue doing that. And that is what I believe. Uh, so, and just now, funny enough, when you're mentioning classrooms and open spaces, just now we are moving from classrooms, from classroom setup into just those project rooms. So as we are talking, people are working in our students' rooms, which are very large open spaces. Uh, we need some projectors, we need some dividers, I mean, whatever, those gray movable walls. It doesn't cost very much. It's more, how can you reorganize space so it becomes both classroom for giving some information and students' workspace for their project room. So maybe next year I could tell you more about that experience, university without classrooms. Okay. I, I... Yeah, I, I think at the university level, it would be easier to, to do more projects. And it's already happening, as you said. But the, I think the, the, the issue about cost is for the infrastructures at the uh, school education level. And that's where we need to concentrate more uh, or to, to change the, the methods of learning in the secondary education so kids can develop the, the, the skills from earlier age. And we know that Yes. Uh, kids are can develop. It's better to develop such skills or creativity, uh, competences, and skills from earlier age, and that's the issue. And in and in current infrastructures of schools in most countries are not designed for this. So at the university level, we have many open spaces, and and of course students can work even in the cafe together. They can go to a cafe and work, but. It's not easy to do things uh, like this in the school education, of course. But the cost is really the building we draw. The building I showed would need 100 million euro to make it, including. Oh, the yeah, but I mean, uh, you don't how to say if we wait for buildings like that to appear, or oh, we will have a long time to wait. Yeah. I think yeah. that we should try adapting even schools. Maybe I'm biased because, you know, Denmark is rich places. I yeah. told you, yeah. they are building schools. I mean, you should see nowadays modern, it's just my neighborhood, they build a new school now. I mean, as add on to existing one, wow. I mean, I think it's even more than eight meters high. It's Good. fantastic. Good. Very good. Anyhow, now comes my question, and that's serious one. That's more about pedagogy, you know, that learning everywhere. Anyhow, I have some some issues with that, uh, you know, those basic human psychology, learning skills, developing working habits, you know, space also happens. But you said something, if a student works, now we are into basic mathematics education where my, my heart is also. And then students see a need to implement Pythagoras theorem. Sorry, students won't see a need to implement Pythagoras theorem. Students would just see that he or she doesn't know how to calculate some lengths. And then without scaffolding, he would be totally lost. And that is what I saw as a supervisor at university, because I mean, we are having that problem, problem based learning, as I'm telling you for ages, and then students just try to skip the bar where it's lowest. They don't think I should learn this mathematical lesson. So how to how to scaffold that? That is my serious pedagogical question. Well, if I understood where the question, the scenario I mentioned about Pythagoras theorem is that uh, when the students work in projects, they work with the monitoring in a sense, mentoring in, in another word or facilitating, they are uh, or supervising or uh, supervised okay. by the by the teacher. So the the, the the students will get stuck. Will get stuck because in order to compute something, as you said, they maybe they cannot do it without the, the Pythagoras theorem. So yes. in that case, in that case is when the, the teacher or the teacher will jump in and say and advise. I think you need something to know here that you probably don't remember or you don't know. So. Go to the learning units, uh, stations, or the learning rooms, and watch this video, and come back. 
Yeah, so exactly the, uh, that was my question. It should be, they should somehow be supervised and then advised yes. by, by the supervisor. Exactly, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, thank So you. thank you very much, Olga, for the question and Gregory for the answer about the open spaces. I mean, this is a good example, like, you know, the higher education and education in general should follow what happens to the industry because this had been introduced by Steve Jobs in the, when he was building the headquarters in California of the Apple, the open spaces, because he, had, he has identified that only through collaboration you are learning, communicate, and innovate. Eh? And this has been introduced by Steve Jobs, I think, by seven, eh? when he built uh, the Apple. Um, thank you very much, Gregory. I can write, you know, I can, you know, comment some of the comments that I have received for the meeting charts. To Anna Nekleva, I will share, you know, this inspiring, you know, um, presentation by Gregory through our YouTube channel. So you will receive the YouTube link to Christos Nikolopoulos. Very nice presentation, Professor McCreasy. This is possible to share the presentation. I mean, we are going to be grateful if um, uh, I, Gregory, you can share the presentation. I will place I it to our it website. You, but, uh, but it will, yeah, yeah, I will place we'll it to the website. It to you. Yeah, we exactly. trust it because it's a big part. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent link. Excellent. To Jorge, uh, George, my friend from Portugal, fantastic presentation. Thanks, Professor McCreelis. And I have to mention that Christian Nicolopoulos is a colleague of us in Hellenic Mediterranean University. George is from IPP. Uh, and for another colleague of mine, uh, George Lodaki, Professor McCreelis, your presentation was quite inspirational. Thank you very much. So you can see that, you know, Thanks. the feedback is like excellent. Next week or in two weeks, we are going to have with us Professor Richard Friend. Um, an ex-professor in Cambridge. Now he's building in Abu Dhabi a new university. Is exactly what uh, uh, Gregory McCready has presented. But Abu Dhabi, they don't wait for 30 years to have money. They have money right now. And Richard Friend, you know, Sir Richard Friend will share with us, you know, this, you know, uh, vision about this new technology university in Abu Dhabi. Um, so thank you very much, Gregory. Thank you very much. All the 35 participants and more are waiting to follow Gregory's presentation. Stay safe and speak to you about tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to have an EPFL uh, scientist that he's going to speak about photocatalysis and how do we use solar harvesting energy in order to advance the technology in this field. So stay safe. See you. Thank soon. you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye, Gregory. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you for the opportunity.